you raise a child to be a good person? What are your responsibilities to your family, your friends, and your larger community? How do you cope with a serious illness? Can you find someone to love? And if you do, how do you go on when they're gone? How do you find joy and meaning in life, especially in difficult times? And how do you make sense of your own life's inevitable end? Life's full of questions, but it's ones like these that keep us up at night. Questions that don't come with an easy answer from Google or from an internet quiz. They strike at the heart of what it means to be human. And during times like these, times of death, suffering, fear, and grief, times of rampant inequality and decreasing compassion, times when we have to confront biases that lurk in many of us, these questions take on an even greater urgency. They keep me up at night too. Not only because, like you, I'm trying to figure out how to live my life in the best way possible, but also because for the past three decades, I've run a psychology lab dedicated to helping people make better decisions by unlocking the secrets of how our minds work. But what I realized the more I studied these questions is that they aren't new. People have been asking them for centuries. Psychologists are the new kids on the block. Before we got here, people were asking spiritual leaders, priests, imams, rabbis, and shamans to help them deal with the challenges of life. And while at first I didn't pay religion much heed, as my team kept running experiments aimed at increasing well-being, we were surprised that many of the answers we found were in line with religious ideas. Even more surprising, though, was that seemingly simple parts of religious practices, even when we strip them of all of their spiritual trappings, turned out to have a profound effect on people nonetheless. We found, for example, that giving thanks, whether to a person or to God, makes people more honest and generous, even to perfect strangers. To our astonishment, we found that even a few weeks of meditation made people more compassionate, more willing to jump up and help others in pain, or to forgive those who would normally provoke them to violence. We found that moving in unison with, with each other to music, as happens in many rituals, made people feel more connected. And it's not just us. Other scientists have found that parts of common rituals can help people feel less anxious and even improve their health. That's when it dawned on me. We were going about this the wrong way. Social scientists like me thought we were discovering new phenomena. What we didn't realize was that they'd been in use for millennia. And so while it's true that we're not going to learn anything about the nature of the universe or the biology of disease from religion, when it comes to understanding how to move how to heal the human mind. It's a different story. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a scientist at heart and by training. I firmly believe that the scientific method is a wonder and the best way to test ideas. But when it comes to generating ideas, trying to understand how people can overcome the trials they face in life, we scientists shouldn't be starting from scratch. When it comes to ideas, just as ancient doesn't always mean wise, neither does it always mean foolish. The only way to know is to put ideas to the test. Not ideas about theology or whether God exists. Those aren't questions science can answer. They rely on faith. Arguing about those gets us nowhere. What I wanna focus on is the power of spiritual practices themselves. Rituals related to birth, love, grief, and death. Practices that can make us healthier and happier. Throughout history, humans have faced plagues, hate, isolation, and exploitation. And yes, sometimes religion was on the wrong side of these issues. The tools it uses to nudge the mind are just that, tools. And like all tools, they're neither good or bad. It's how we choose to use them that matters. After a decade of scientific study, we now know that meditation increases compassion and decreases stress. But it began as a spiritual practice meant to do just that. And so that raises a question. 
What's the next mindfulness? What are the next spiritual practices we can adapt and use to help people along the road of life? They're out there if we're willing to look and to follow the data. And so I invite you to join me for four conversations with people who think about these questions a lot and who right now are in the thick of it, trying to figure out how to apply wisdom from those who have gone before so that we can emerge from 2020 a stronger, happier people and as a more compassionate and just society. I hope you'll join me.